All right, everybody, we just wrapped up a podcast here about making your rifle and entire setup fit you more properly. We talked a little bit about chassis versus rifle stocks. We talked about setting up your optic right, cheek weld, length of pull, even natural point of aim and proper shooting form. Really interesting one. Don't want to miss it. Let us know what you think in the comments below, too. Thanks for watching, everybody. All right, what's up, everybody? We are here, Mark and myself, Jimmy on the mic, and across the table joining us is Ruben. Ruben was p miming something at at Mark. You said, here we go, and I did the Joker thing. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Also drinking a bubbly water, and Scott Parks. It's been a while since we had him on. He's drinking uh, moonshine. I have a hit. Oh, you hit, you hit it. Okay. Conscious. <laughs> We're still not sure he's, if it's actually moonshine he's, uh, or not. He's, he's a little bit nervous, getting a little loose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's always kind of a, you never know what you're going to expect out of Scott Parks. That's that's how that goes. He's a large male. He can drink a lot of moonshine. That won't affect him that fine. much. So one thing we wanted to talk about today was basically, and I don't know if it's the right way to phrase it. You guys can help me out with this perhaps, but is kind of making your rifle fit you instead of necessarily making you fit your rifle. There's all kinds of things when you see um, it happens in ARs too right in front of me on the table right now is a bunch of bolt guns but there's got to be some kind of reason why there are so many stocks out there different kinds of stocks and cheek risers um, length of pole adjustment butt plate things. You see people run in stocks where there's a million different knobs all over them that make something, you know, come out, go up, down, twist side to side. Some people are actually angling their butt stock things on chassis guns. There's chassis just in general. Um, and then all kinds of different things too when it comes to a lot of this plays into the optic as well, you know, as far as the mounts and all that. Everything has to interact with you. You have to interact with everything in the name of accuracy at the end of the day, right? And and how do these things come into that? Like what do you what do you guys, Ruben, you and Scott, you guys have a bunch of different guns. Ruben, you've got three gun setups, you have long range setups, hunting setups. Scott, you are really into the long range stuff. Um yourself. How do you go about fitting your rifle to you, getting it all set up with the, you know, what you're using, what components, especially in, when it comes to like the stocks and getting it all fitted right. Honestly, I, I just figure out what feels right for me, right? Like, it's just like, um, you know, building position or taking that shot. I mean, I don't hunt, but if I did and I had a long range shot or any shot, if I'm not comfortable in my position, the position that I've built to take that shot, I'm going to rearrange that position until I am as comfortable as possible. Right. 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 Um, so it's the same thing with a rifle, right? Like if I'm shooting and something just feel right, I'm going to start messing with it to figure out what it is. Yeah. You know, maybe it's length of pull. Maybe I didn't mount the scope properly for its eye relief. Um, maybe it's the cheek, cheek weld. Maybe, maybe the trigger shoe is straight and actually my hands not just fitting that trigger shoe good so i should move to a curved trigger shoe to get my finger back farther so i can get a good 90 degree on my trigger finger mm -hmm. you know those type of things um but really you know to go back to your question why is there so many different methods stocks and stuff out there because well for one there's way more than one way to skin a cat here right you're gonna get different opinions from multiple people um but there's just more one way to skin the cat when it comes to it, right? You have to just build what fits you. Yeah. You know, the stock that I like, Ruben doesn't, probably doesn't like it all that much. Different you know? body types, too. <laughs> I was going to say different body types, different applications. Yeah. Yeah. What do, does the way a rifle gets set up, does it differ between, like Ruben, for you, you, you do a number of different applications. So from hunting to three gun to long range stuff. Does your rifles, uh, does the setups, does the angle of the pistol grip, for example, does the style of the trigger, whether it's curved or flat, does the stock and all that stuff change between application, or do you kind of keep it the same? Is the style of shooting pretty much the same across all those things? Yeah, so when uh, Scott referred to kind of being comfortable, that's that's really one of the keys here is um, 
like if you talk to a guy like Jerry Mitchell who says that you should cross train and try with all these different guns and be able to pick up any gun and apply the fundamentals of marksmanship to that gun and shoot well with it, there's there's a lot to be said about that. Being able to know how to operate different firearms, different stocks, chassis, triggers, whatever. Um, but if we're trying to eliminate variables, whether it be in hunting application, um, you know, law enforcement, military professional, or competitive shooter, um, we're trying to be, be as comfortable as we can with those platforms that we use. So whether that's a long gun, a pistol, uh, a, a carbine, a shotgun, if we can get to the point where that gun feels like it's an extension of our arms um, or it's an extension of our body, we don't have to think about that while we're shooting. And while we're shooting, um, especially shooting on the clock or shooting in a stressful situation, hunting, um, you know, professional gunfighter application, uh, we don't want to be thinking about variables. We want to be able to have all that kind of be second nature to us. And so I think that if we can get that gun as as uh, catered towards our body, body type and the type of shooting and our position that we're shooting in, um, it's less that we have to think about. So your mind only has so much space for you to think, right? There's, there's um, only so much space where you can have that conscious thought dedicated to what you're doing and have you want to have as much of that be subconscious as possible. So mm-hmm. if the gun fits us, and we're not having to think about, oh, I have to scoot forward on this stock because it's a little longer. Or, oh, this stock is butt heavy, so I'm going to have to shoot it with more rear support. Well, if we have to think about that while we're either on the clock or in a stressful situation, that takes less mental capacity. That takes mental capacity away from what we actually should be doing, which is placing that shot accurately, aiming, pressing the trigger, all that stuff. So, yeah, I think whether you're a competitive shooter, professional that carries a gun on the job, or a hunter, the better the gun fits you, the more you can focus on what you're actually doing in that moment. Mm-hmm. So I think there's there's things like um, from the competitive action shooting side, uh, three gun, two gun, pistol shooting. Uh, I'm always trying to get that gun fit to me. I'm trying to get it so, like I said, it's an extension of my body. I don't even have to think about when I pull that gun up. Um, Scott alluded to the scope positioning on the gun too. So mm-hmm. if we're doing a lot of prone shooting that scope might be in a different position than if we're doing a lot of offhand shooting. And that's where you start oh, really? to see... You yeah. vary that a little bit. Yep, that's where you start to see like modern carbines like ARs with an adjustable stock, um, even stocks that are like a precision-type stock but in an adjustable configuration uh, where we can ad- make rapid adjustments on the go. Uh, when we're shooting, whether it's prone, offhand, unsupported, supported, we're going to make adjustments to that to that gun so that we can get wow, it. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so there well, is isn't that why always... so many of the competitive three gun guys are running like a like a PRS style stock. Yeah, oftentimes yep. so yep. they can make those adjustments. Yep, There's I always like thought a, that was weird. Um, they're not super adjustable on the fly, but like a TAC mod stock or an XLR um, stock versus like the um, the Luth AR stocks or like a Magpul PRS or a UBR. Uh, those stocks you can make adjustments on the fly, and they're precision stocks. So. Hmm. Um, that precision type of stock, whether it be in an Accuracy International chassis, a KRG, or um, something like a Magpul PRS stock, those all have adjustments for length of pull and your uh, your sight height or your your cheek pe- cheek position. Mm-hmm. That's interesting to hear you say that. You know, based on you know essentially the shooting position, you might make an adjustment. I mean, I I've seen all that adjustability, and I assumed it was you know obviously to to make the gun fit you better and and be you know and perform optimally for you your shooting style body type whatever but i didn't i didn't realize that guys would make adjustments depending on on just their their position yeah and i think it really boils down into how well you can apply the fundamentals of marksmanship so your natural point of aim getting behind the gun how the gun fits you and that all helps you make that shot and so i think yeah, we might have a stock that has a million different adjustments, but we might only use four different adjustments on that stock, and you need to get to know your gear. But I think it's a good time to probably point out when, you know, what really we're trying to achieve to help us make an accurate shot. So, I mean, Scott can speak a lot to that. Yeah, the the one thing I wanted to back up to, though, is like we kind of jumped right into the, I would say, moderate to experienced user Mm -hmm. right um you know if if we definitely you want to have fundamentals down first before you get into trying yeah i was hoping we talk about that (laughs) a little bit right yeah so um because if you go trying to fit comfort to your unfundamental style like 
you may get really lucky and end up being a genius that figure out this new shooting style, but probably not. Right. You know, um. like I, I always think, <laughs> I always think back to you watch the NBA and pretty much everybody's shooting just about the same way. And they're all really good at it. You get the occasional guy that's shooting some really weird form like Dirk Nowitzki or something like that. And somehow he managed to make it work. But, but for the most part, there's kind of one way to do it. Right, <laughs> yeah. You right. know, that's why all pitchers pitch sidearm <laughs> or wait, no, yes. they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they're all knuckleballers. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so getting into the, the fundamentals of things, I know Scott, I've heard you, I've heard you break it down before just as far as making a good, shot with a rifle it is kind of a science it is it is kind of uh oh it's an art an art yeah yeah i'd say it is more of an art um what all what all goes into it as you're as you're making a shot you know somebody like me i know there's just been times where i'm you know looking through the scope and uh, oh the crosshairs are right on the middle okay boom you know like i just want it to go off now right you know but i didn't actually think about anything that was happening yeah i mean i guess it kind of depends on the scenario um you know if i'm if if i've got all the time in the world and i'm shooting prone and i need to shoot you know the most precise accurate shots i possibly can then i'm i'm 100 percent thinking about fundamentals Mm -hmm. right because i have time to yeah um sometimes that may get me in trouble i might have been better off just going up there and shooting just going off what my years of shooting experience, but oh, it's yeah, just where I go to when it. I have time, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but now, if if I don't have time, I'm, I'm just relying on my my experience and practice, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and if, experience plays into time too. You revert back to those learned, you know, principles. Oh, yeah, even yeah. when you're not thinking about it, that's that subconscious thing. Well, yeah. and and I don't I don't know a shooter out there that doesn't develop a bad habit that they already had years ago that they got rid of and it has come back. Oh yeah. Right. Because you start, you get into this, you know, you tweak one little thing, but you don't realize it. And then you just start shooting that way. And then all of a sudden one day you realize you're like, why is this happening all of a sudden? Mm. And it takes, and a lot of times you won't even be able to figure it out. It'll take a friend to point out something really obvious that really basic that you're doing. Yeah. That, you know, Somehow you just reverted back to it because you started to develop a bad habit somewhere along the line, um, you know. And you st- say you you know you stopped dry firing or you stopped practicing loading shotgun or yep. whatever it may be, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you you cannot get away from the fundamentals if you want to be um, better than a novice shooter. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about that a lot with. Uh, the, the Vortex experience that we do here, bringing uh, whether it be dealers or customers in to see Vortex and do a couple of days of shooting with us, we typically will do about a half day at our indoor facility, uh, and we do pistol and carbines and let uh, the the people that are attending kind of get behind some guns they maybe have never had a chance to shoot. Uh, one thing we did a lot this last year is a lot of pistol red dots, and so shooting... Uh, you know, Glock MOSs and M&P cores and uh, IWI Masadas with a red dot on them and have uh, a customer get behind the gun and experience why they're seeing so many magazine articles and, new. you know, Recoil talks about it and uh, their favorite IG influencers are posting videos with red dot on their pistol and stuff. And we get a lot of people that, like, that's one of the first things they want to, like, shoot long range. Now, I want to shoot a pist- red dot on a pistol. And... We, with pistol shooting, there's some fundamentals like your foot positioning and your stance and Mm kind of how you hold the gun. And I'm not going to say that I can look at somebody's groups on paper and tell what they're doing. I mean, there's very advanced instructors that probably could get there. But I can see that someone who starts out listening to the very simple instruction that we give, all of a sudden their groups start opening up or they're missing consistently. And I'll take a step back and just look at their feet first thing I do is look at their feet and you'll sure enough their feet will be wrong or their shoulder their shoulders will be angled towards the target instead of squared up there's a number of things that go into that Mm -hmm. and over time as you continually build those fundamentals they start to become second nature and you don't think about it anymore but again like Scott mentioned five years down the road you're like I cannot hit these targets I'm at a match I'm having a bad match 
I'm having a hard time with 35 yard four inch pistol squares. And I'm good with that. Like I can hit that target. And then you watch a video of yourself from that stage, which is the real reason we all video ourselves at matches. It's not so we can watch it, but so we can evaluate where we well, made mistakes. Some of them. Yeah, well, I, I don't speak for the entire practical <laughs> shooting community. All those followers on Instagram got to see. <laughs> yeah. Some. Well, I mean, I post it there because it's easy to go back and review it. You know, I don't want to go into gallery and select. And, no. You know, I'd just rather yeah. go to my Instagram and look it's at it. It's so hard when you can actually control how much you rewind everything. Yeah. I have to go through and watch totally. the whole minute to, in order to restart. Yep. Yeah. I would much rather view it on Instagram. Um, <laughs> Jim and I shot some pistol the other day. I, I will not be posting that on Instagram. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I'd appreciate if you did. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would. <laughs> but yeah, you can go back and look and be like, oh, yeah. that's because my feet were completely wrong or yeah. my shoulders were the wrong way or my stance was just jacked. What are the most important fundamentals? I know, I know as like, Stance or position sort of being squared up to the target or something like that. I've heard people talk about that. You hear a ton of people talk about the trigger, pull, or press. Yeah, there's... Or whatever, I don't know. Sight picture. There's a whole lot picture. of things that translate from rifle shooting to pistol shooting. And vice versa. Um, and vice versa. And I think that those things ultimately boil down to, you know, things that come to my mind uh, are going to be your positioning. Um, and natural point of aim is something that, you know, I think Scott should talked about that, but like having that position where you're relaxed and you're not straining a lot to get, you know, that proper position. Um, but yeah, your trigger press, not trigger pull, trigger press. And, um, it's not, so when people say it's not a trigger pull, what are they talking about? <laughs> I think if, uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I it can't. has everything to do with, with this and not from Black Hawk down, but like this 90 this degree angle safety. here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if I'm pulling a trigger, I'm like hooking my finger around it and I'm pulling You're it. You're changing the I'm angle. pulling it, right? Cha- okay. And, and my finger is going like this. Mm-hmm. I want just the pad of my finger on the trigger and I press it. So this is actually a press. Oh, okay. Right? This is a pull. Oh. So when you pull, you're kind of, if I'm right-handed, if I were to pull the trigger, I'd kind of pull the gun back into the right a little bit. Whereas You'll pull if I, the back of the gun to the right, which points the which muzzle, points to the the muzzle a little bit to the left. Yeah. Whereas if I were pressing the trigger, I wouldn't be imparting you just pull, any. It's just pressing it firmly just to the rear. It, firmly yeah. to the it rear. depends. Yeah. And it, it, would, pr- it depends on the gun. Like, you tell a guy that shoots... Point zero nine splits on a rifle with a super fast AR trigger, like that. You need to focus on your trigger press. Like he's just trying to put two pieces, of, two bullets on a piece of paper this big. So he's probably not thinking a lot about that. Okay, that's but fair. if you started yeah, out slow yeah. and built fundamentals, and you know, yeah, talk about natural point of aim a little bit. Um, or if you think it's a myth, because there's all kinds of opinions. Well. I, I guess um, I, I actually haven't heard that, that uh, people have an opinion that it's a myth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's maybe how bizarre that is. I think it's a myth. There you go. I'm your first. Um, I'm just lot. kidding. I have no you heard idea. a lot. We probably should have talked about it in shotguns last week, but you heard a lot in shotgun shooting. Okay. Well, I could see maybe some trap shooters. Yeah. I mean, because, Fitting a gun. Yeah. It's, but, um, but there's no doubt when... I mean, so if, if I can get in a position, close my eyes for 10 seconds, open up my eyes, and I'm still on target, there's, there's nobody's going to tell me that that's not a benefit to my shooting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> I would. Right? <laughs> Think about Vortex Extreme. When yeah. you guys get to some of the really nasty stages that we des- design in your shooting position, you're, like, trying to kind of scoot up the side of the hill so you can like, right. just right. lean over and just see the target and then break a trigger. It's like... That's not natural because you're strained. You have muscles that are firing the whole time you're doing that. You want oh, to get to totally. a relaxed spot. Yeah. Using your bone structure as support. Yeah, I'll tell you. And in that position, the, the toughest thing to learn is follow through, right? Because for yeah. some reason, when you're in an uncomfortable position, as soon as the but as soon as the gun goes bang, your body says, Okay, relax. Yeah, you want to get out you're of done. it. You're <laughs> done. You know? Thank God that's over. <laughs> and it's the absolute worst thing you can do for that shot. You know? really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Follow through. Follow through is a big thing. Whether you be a, a shotgunner, um, a pistol shooter, a rifle rifleman, I mean, follow through is huge. Every time I hear people talk about follow through, I assume they're talking about like I pulled the trigger and somehow in the short amount of time that the bar- bullet's still in the barrel, I managed to like you know that movie where they they curve the bullet. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> like I feel like yep. that if I don't like follow Angelina through, Jolie. I'm gonna, Angelina Jolie curve the bullet. Yeah. Is that what you're talking? Or is or is the idea of follow through more? There, what what is it? So a a good example of of where you need a well, I mean, you need good follow through anywhere. Now, there's certain guns are definitely less forgiving okay. and more forgiving, right? Bolt guns are pretty forgiving to a- absence of follow through. Yeah. Generally speaking, especially oh, the heavier okay. the gun, the better. Okay. And the you know, um, whereas if you get into ARs, right, right, like any, any semi-automatic rifle, really, and then um, and then or like precision twenty-two shooting, just because it's a much slower velocity bullet. Okay. Right. Um, that's that's the whole reason. If you ever noticed, um, like small bore silhouette shooters or or twenty-two, you know, Olympic shooters mm-hmm. have those. What the hell they call them? Beluga tubes or yeah. whatever for, for to extend their sight radius, right? Sure. Um, so they can run a shorter barrel, but they want the sight radius for the iron sights for the for yeah. The you precision. want that bullet out of there as soon as possible because you're huh. you're affecting it with movement, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I always there's there's you know with rifle shooting follow up is it's a little harder to understand. I think I think for me the thing that really struck me when I was younger is follow through in um, talking about waterfowl shooting. Um, shooting a passing bird, mm-hmm. right, a crossing bird, uh, and there's an ambush where you put the gun up and you're like, the bird's going to cross right here and I'm going to wait for it, and then there's and then there's following the bird. And what can happen is in a bolt gun, like a, you know, a bolt action rifle, I believe the lock time is somewhere around that two milliseconds time mm-hmm. versus an AR, that lock time from the time the trigger breaks till that hammer hits the, the primer or the firing pin. Oh, right, The lock right. time is six to eight milliseconds. So you're looking at three to four times the length of time that it, that passes. So that's there's some people that are really good uh, shooters with a, with a gas gun, with an AR, and there's some people that are not so good with a gas gun, even though it might be a very accurate gas gun. So that kind of that concept of ambushing a target on a moving target on a crossing bird is – there's going to be a point of time between when your brain says, okay, now, and when the hammer strikes the firing pin, all that happens, and the bullet or the shot exits, um, that ambush is not going to be as nearly, nearly as effective because you're going to miss a lot of birds because you're not going to process things fast enough when you need um, to make that, unless you lead the bird a considerable amount. But even so, the more um, – the the – far more effective method is to acquire your target and follow it. And then as you either, as your bead passes in front of it, break the shot, but you're continuing, even after you've broken the shot, you're continuing swinging the gun. Okay. And that's because you don't want that point where that gun is stationary. If you're trying to shoot a moving target, Mm. but with a rifle, like a bolt action rifle shooting long range or shooting, you know, precision shooting, the kind of like Scott said, you don't want the gun to start moving immediately after you shoot fire the the shot. Right. Yeah. And well, so I, I guess when you think like about like when you look at the inside of a rifle scope, like this scope has a dime back tactical first focal plane on it. Fantastic rifle scope. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that brief commercial brought to you by Vortex Optics. But um, you think about how little one turret click moves the reticle inside that thing, and then I guess if you pull the trigger and impart a little movement on it, even a visible movement that you impart on a gun can make a big difference downrange if if only one tiny click can make a decent di- difference downrange, especially at longer range. It seems like, you know, I, I feel like I'm drawing some parallels between any sport where you want, like, the projectile to go straight. Like, you think if you're playing baseball and you made contact with the ball and you just gave up on your swing at that point. Right. Or, or golf and you... You make contact with Which ball people do, and, and right. Yes, and check you, swings, half swings. You know, Ichiro and you, Suzuki, and yeah. you just yeah, and you just give up, and you know the the ball's likely not going to go straight. Yeah, or think about it in terms of basketball. If as soon as the basketball leaves your fingertips, you just freeze. Yeah, like, right. That doesn't. That's not how we shoot baskets. That's fair. Yeah, I've been told. I'm not a big. I think you are correct. <laughs> Does that? I was does gonna that say play sports ball like Ryan always says, <laughs> but I'm ball. like, you know, I'm not that. No, <laughs> no, not that guy. And does that play into the natural point of aim thing? We're talking. I know I got us on a little bit of a follow through. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And Absolutely. What is in natural point of aim is just 
Like if I'm sitting here right now, do yep. I? Uh, my natural point of aim, I'm guessing, is somewhere where I'm relaxed and just exactly. looking straight ahead. Like I'm not That's really going to exactly move. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, a, a good if if you <laughs> I'll tell you if you want to learn natural point of aim, try NRA high power shooting. Um, because essentially, if if you don't have a good position, you are fighting the rifle the whole time to keep it on target. How's how so with that so, so with, competition particular right? So particular. with high power shooting, you're the sh- with NRA higher power, which which I don't shoot. So I'm not no professional. I know enough to know what the positions are, and and you know if you really want to know, ask Brandon <laughs> Green or Carl Bernowski. There you go. Noted. <laughs> um, but you know you're shooting prone, kneeling, sitting, standing. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Unsupported. Got it. So all you have is a sling. Not easy. Right. So if you don't have that natural point of aim figured out, and you've got this sling, you know they've they've got them wrenched down pretty tight to the point of like cutting off circulation, generally. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's actually very dangerous. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's all guys, Newtons. It's lost, all your physician. We lost a lot of good men. Oh, you can you can. I mean, even Brando's like come off the line his hands freaking numb most of the time. You know. Um, Golly, really? Oh yeah. Oh, they'll lay there because there's. They're waiting on, you know, they're waiting for a good time to shoot, you know, in between. Oh, like the F-Class heavy guys. Heavy yeah, right? it's, yeah. It's exactly like F-Class except for without a bipod Jeez. or rest. <laughs> I can picture that, too, because you're not, for lack of a term, you don't have these crutches to, like, help you work around yeah. that rifle fit. Right. So they're, they're getting themselves set up in a position where they can be relaxed in that position and have the gun be aiming at exactly, the target. Exactly, at the target. Were. Okay. Yeah, because all they want to have to worry about is calling the wind and putting that shot exactly. How where do you they want. figure? How do you figure that out? Is your natural point of aim? Does Does everybody have a natural point of aim? That's something you can figure well, they, out, or do you do you have to learn it over time? No, oh, no, you can figure it out definitely. Okay. So, um, I mean, of course, once you get the fundamentals down, and with high power shooting, you know, obviously you'd want the right sling, the right gun. Of course, the gun would have to be set up for you. Um, yeah, <laughs> that type of thing. But uh, it's kind of exactly what I alluded to a little bit ago is, um, you know, you find that position to where you can have the rifle on target, close your eyes and open them back up and you're still on target. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what you want for natural point of aim, especially for that type of shooting. Yeah. And does and so like when you're finding that, I'm guessing you probably have to find a natural point of aim. Like It's probably different when you're prone versus kneeling, standing, oh, yeah. sitting. Yep. And does it does it change depending on the gun? So, so, like, let's say I'm shooting a a gun, like, with this cheek riser here or something like that with a length of pole the way it is or something like that or the bipod, if the bipod's different or something. Yeah, I mean, at, at the higher level, I, I have to assume that um, those guys really aren't changing guns very often. Yeah. Right? I mean, they've been working at that for a long time. They're, they've got a system that has is working for them. Um I mean, I don't and, adjust and my stock before a match. You know, like right. the way that my stocks are set up, like I don't, I don't touch it. Like I'm, you know, competitive shooters are all super si- superstitious about making changes and stuff, and that's one that directly affects how you're going to shoot. So, yeah. yeah, I think those guys are probably even more heightened. Their awareness is more heightened about what they need to do. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out what I'm what I'm getting at is like, how do I know when I'm in a position that like if I got down behind a gun and I was just sort of like, yeah, this is a position where if I close my eyes for 10 seconds, do I just have to try and well, point, for point one, around a lot? Well, or for just... one, if you're, if you're um, with high power shooting, and I, and I think that probably is one of the easiest um, styles of shooting to learn natural point of aim and what, what the definition of natural point of aim is. Yeah. It's definitely not one of the easiest disciplines to learn by <laughs> any means. Um, just because... The simple fact that you will be literally fighting that gun to keep it on target if yeah. you don't have your natural point of aim correct. Right. Yeah, gotcha. you're, you're I mean, like, you will be fighting is... it. Like, your arms will start shaking. <laughs> You'll be pushing the gun whichever way. Oh, I'm sure. Does it start out by, like, those guys as they start learning it, does it start out where they just hold the gun up in a position where they're not getting tired and then, like, try and work around no, it that, becomes or? It becomes pretty easy, really, right? I mean, because especially if... Uh, you know, if, if you're shooting, if you're shooting any rifle, any scope division, right now you're limited to field of view. Right. So, so if 
so if you're not on target, well, your natural point of aim is way off. Right, right. Right? Um, so you want to be able to get into that, that the fundamental position that you have learned over the years, right? The back to basics, fundamentals of high power shooting. Um, and you literally are just adjusting your body into the direction of the target until the natural point of aim settles Got down. Got it. Yeah, okay. you want to get to a point where the gun right. is interfaced to your body and not moving in relation to your body. Gotcha. I'm pointing my body at the target. And that's where you were saying the gun becomes an extension of your yep. body. No, so right. it's, yeah, you exactly. don't treat it like a separate thing from you, that you're standing still and the gun's moving around. You, If you move, the gun moves. The like gun if you moves, see a you pistol move. shooter, okay, if you see a pistol shooter and I told somebody, all right, I want you to point at that target and then at that target, if they went like this and then like this versus this and this, okay, yeah. the, the pistol isn't moving this way. My body's moving yeah. versus this and then this. Yeah, your body. Right, really the weird. gun's moving in relation to my body, which is not how it should be doing. I just want okay. my body. I'm aiming with my body effectively. Got it. Got it. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that clicked. No, people I, saw how fat I was. I feel like. Dang it. I think you, I, you look great in that polo. Thanks. It's a good color. Appreciate that. I'm sure there's like a lot of finer points, but I can think of like the probably the grossest exaggeration of like improper fit. And that's when I started shooting guns as a youth because I was shooting full-size guns oh, yeah. as a youth, right? Yep. And what? Oh, he just took another swig of that moonshine here. Oh, boy. He's getting ready for Unleash half the hour number two. Uh, <laughs> but he, like Scott was talking about earlier, like creeping up on a gun to get that sight picture. Like, you know, you're having to do make all sorts of crazy adjustments to get that field of view through the rifle scope. And so like... And, and, of course, now, like, I'm shooting probably the same type of guns, but, like, you know, I've grown into them a little bit. Like, that that becomes a lot easier. But I'm sure, sure. – I'm not sure, but, like, to some degree, is it – can you sort out an adjustment that you might want to make just because you're like, oh, to get a proper sight picture here, I have to do A or B or C, or I'm having to do this with the gun, you know, kind of making it fit – so you've seen somebody on the you've seen somebody prone while you're hunting, right, on the ground, and they're like doing all this scooching, yeah, right. They're like oh yes, yeah. that's because they're trying to get their body pointed perfectly at the target. They don't know what they, some people probably do know what they're doing, but that person might not understand that. Like you could just point the gun, but that's not going to set you up for any type of follow up. Your eye relief isn't going to be good. You're when when the gun goes off, you're not going to be able to come back and watch your impact. Like you're it trying just to feels scooch. awkward. Yeah, and that's like it's kind mm. of a kind of a subconscious subliminal thing where you're you don't understand what you're doing, but you're trying to get comfortable. And that's what Scott said. Like all this kind of boils down to being comfortable behind the gun. Right. Right. So if you can get to that point where you're like, oh, okay, that's good. And now you're scooched and like, you didn't think like, oh, I need to get my natural point of aim. Like, no, you just got to the point where everything felt right. Well, that's fair. Right. It's also, I'll say this, it's safer too. Like I will admit, even though it's hard to admit that with a light recoiling 6.5 Creedmoor and a scope with decent eye relief, I've still been scope-eyed pretty dang good. The magnum recoil. The magnum <laughs> recoil of a suppressed and braked 6.5 Creedmoor. <laughs> I happen to be trying to set up. I did exactly what you just said. I moved the gun and not my body because we were yeah. going against the clock at the Vortex Extreme, which gets brought up quite a bit here. Move the gun. I thought, oh, there it is. I'll just try and rip this up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, the, sh the stock is not in my shoulder yeah. at all. It's in my bicep. So gun goes off. Gun Im scope immediately goes into my eye. Blood coming down my nose. And it was it was the picture. It was the classic picture of not. Guy from stage seven, day. if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I applied the bandage to your head, from being scope-eyed, I hope I did it so that you don't have a big scar. <laughs> that's nice that you just yeah, said Disclaimer. That. That's, ni that's nice that you said that. We didn't even talk about recoil control, but that's another huge portion of po proper positioning. You know, recoil control. and Yeah. That's, that's yeah. huge. And ha which has also, which ties right back into yeah. following through. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Honestly, right. So, yeah. Is it, I've I mean, heard you guys talk before, Scott, too, about like, you know, PRS shooters, they like these really big, heavy-hitting cartridges like 
six dasher, you know, the ones that <laughs> you really have to be careful how many rounds you shoot a day. Yeah. Stuff like that. That'll put a that'll put a six G T. Yeah, you don't you don't what you don't want to do is have any type of scarring on your shoulder. So they they you know anyways. They uh but when you guys some light for those not familiar. Yeah, yep. It's kinda like shooting a two twenty three. Um but what you guys sometimes do is when you find yourself not following through or having bad fundamentals or poor fundamentals, like you guys go to a bigger gun, right? Well, not Scott because he doesn't like big guns, but a lot of times people will <laughs> shoot like a three hundred eight, right? Because I mean, unless everything you've ever told me you're just making up, but really, like <laughs> really stepping into the big leagues there. Um. Well, no, I would say that you you should, in my opinion, definitely interject some three hundred eight into your training on a regular basis. If you're predominantly yeah, without shooting, a muzzle break, yeah. If you're predominantly shooting six, you know, six six five, yeah. Um. Just because it'll bring you back down to reality. Get those launch those two fundamentals, right? Like twelves. Because I mean, you know, most people listening are probably like three hundred eight. What kind of recoil has that got? You know, well, if you're shooting something like a six millimeter all the time, three hundred eight is hellacious. (laughs) 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 Why would anyone ever do that to themselves? You know, so. And and it does. It, it will show you every flaw that you have developed over the years of shooting a six millimeter. Because you can just get away more with you, with a six with, mil. You get with away like with a, a lot more. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What hmm. is it about the three hundred eight? Like you get behind a three hundred eight and you go boom, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, sh-. like I did. Well, that. it's like oh, sorry, Ryan. You're gonna have to get a bleep in there. <laughs> <laughs> if if you don't have <laughs> that, it's like you gotta keep that horse on the reins. I yeah. Mean, it, like, otherwise, it's getting away from you. Okay. So it's kind of part of, like, you don't want to get scope-eyed. You also want to be able to follow through and see what you're hitting or missing. But, you and know, I having a gun that pushes time, your... you're not saying death grip it, no, right? No, no, it's not like, you know, like, uh, it's not like going out and shooting 100 rounds of 300 wind mag in an evening to test a scope or something. Yeah. Like, with a three oh eight again, compared to the 6 millimeter or whatever, you're going to have to be, I'm guessing, you're... you're you're going to have to have it well s- seated in your shoulder. You're going to have to be... Now we're talking about without a muzzle brake here. Without a muzzle brake. Yeah, there's no such thing as free recoil with an un- unbraked 308. Yeah, I mean, you could... Free recoil, that's a whole other podcast. Wait, there's not? Free Reezy. <laughs> um, okay, so, like, I'm trying to think... I'm trying to think... If you go down to a 6 mil or something like that, it recoils less... Why do you have to be doing the same stuff that you'd be doing with a 308 if you're doing it with a cartridge that recoils less? Does, well, that, does that make sense? Like, why? Yeah, would... and, and that's the thing is 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 immediately you don't. Okay. But you end up compounding on those. Um, er, you know, every time you're going out and shooting a match or practicing, you're getting farther and farther and farther away from your fundamentals if you're not concentrating on them. You can develop bad gonna, habits. You can develop bad habits, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're automatically When going you first to get your driver's license, you pretty much stick to the speed limit. And then after a while, you start to... <laughs> I mean, I've yeah. heard people and then you, speed. And, oh, so the 308 is like getting in a car and you're driving, but your mom's in the car again. Yeah. It's like instantly... You got to respect instantly that Instantly, you realize what speed limits are. You use your turn signal. I've never, I've never sped. But for people that do, yeah, it's that exact same thing. The 308 is your mom in the passenger seat. Yeah. I, <laughs> the three oh eight I'm just not sure. <laughs> I'm with you. The three oh eight's like when your manager comes to the Sydney house. I was, oh, that's, I was the manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the captain now. But no, I mean I I, th- I mean it makes a lot of sense. You know, I mean you're coming back to you have to have those fundamentals if you're going to drive that 308. You got to drive yep. the rifle, Jim. I stole that completely from Scott from a different podcast, but that's all right. Um, but it, I'm but it sure makes I sense. Stole it like from somebody at some point, so it's a those smaller cartridges. They're they're friendlier to shoot. You can get away with more. Maybe you don't have to have that's you know super proper positioning perhaps or anything because you're just gonna be able to shoot it better. Yeah. Well, and, there, and there's and there, it kind of goes into a whole other subject also, but. You know, shooting 308 is much harder to do in the wind. It's much harder okay. to do off of barricades. Just there's more re- every single position 308 is tougher, right? It's just it's not a very efficient cartridge. 
Sorry, three weight lovers. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, compared to six I'm millimeters there. or the or the you know six five yeah stuff that you know the three weight's just not it's it's not really competitive. If you don't need terminal energy, you know, inside of five hundred yards, right? The three weight's just not competitive, right? Yeah. Um, but it's a great learning tool. Now, are there other great learning tools out there? Absolutely. But 308's easy. It's there. It's well known. It's a super forgiving cartridge. You know, you're if you build a 308, the chances of it not shooting phenomenally are very slim. Right. right? It's it's just a it's a great cartridge. Hmm. It's just not a cup of tea I, today. No, that's I love how the, <laughs> I love how like the maximum cartridge Scott will ever talk about like it tops out at 308. <laughs> like, has he ever touched your 300 Wizzum? Wizzum, 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 Wizzum? Oh, Wizzum. Wizzum. The original one, I did. You did? You shot that? You did yeah. not. Yeah, I remember when? I was trying to get it to shoot for you. Yeah, I do remember that. Did you like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what, I, what, I, <laughs> what I want to know, what I want to know is getting back to like um, stocks and whatnot. Is is how how that can come into play? Because Scott, I'm sure you have. When it comes to precision, every, a lot of people listen to this love long range precision stuff, right? When it comes yep. to precision, are you are you like, yeah, give me any any gun in any stock, no. I can do it. You have your stock that you go to, right? And what is it about it? How do you like? Is there a place that you can go? where they can fit you to a stock like you get fit into a shoe, you know? Because I'm thinking to myself, like, I started out on a Ruger American, and I didn't have a cheek rest on here right now. Shout out Bradley Cheek Rest. I should do that because I've added these to many, many different guns. I didn't have a cheek rest on it, and I shot it, and it was okay-ish. Right. Um, but I have a really skinny face. This has a super skinny stock. It wasn't that great of a cheek weld that I felt I had. So I put a cheek riser on it, and I thought, oh, wow, that's super awesome. All of a sudden, it was, like, way better, but I had to go out and buy a cheek riser. It's possible, maybe. I sure. don't know that I wouldn't have liked it. You know, and then I go and I get the Magpul Hunter stock, and now there's this, I can adjust length of pole, and I don't know anything about how to adjust length of pole, you know, and all this, I guess there's all these other things, and I have no idea... I don't know if when I shoot this thing, if it feels good, if that's as good as it's going to get, or no, maybe I should adjust something, but if I do adjust it, how do I adjust it? How much? Yeah. Well, for one, it definitely is something that comes just over time with experimenting as right. with a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, you can go to all the schools and classes in the world, and it may feel like that sooner or later one of them taught you this, it's like the setup of your gun, but really all it was was sooner or later all your fundamentals come together and everything happens to click that day. And all of a sudden, in your mind, this setup is finally where it needs to be. You figured it out. This is your favorite stock. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you that's likely what happened to me um, yeah. also, right? Like I can remember – I can't remember it really to the day. I mean I remember about when it happened. Um, I just happened to be out shooting. I had tried uh, a chassis one day, uh, twelve-ish years ago or something, and, uh, and I was just like, "Man, it is really easy to stay on target with this thing." You know, it's like I can I can watch every freaking bullet impact, and, and the guns, the stocks just driving straight. Everything's just like really working. Yeah, this is my new favorite stock. <laughs> You know, right? Just like that. You know, and and I don't know. I mean, the stock for my body, maybe that happened, or maybe it was just everything finally clicked for me. And it happened you know? to be when and, you were using that one. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know, but I still use that yeah. stock to this day. So. And is that is that out of, <laughs> so out of curiosity? Like, is that a stock or is that a chassis? It's a chassis. What's the difference between stocks and chassis? Are chassis are chassis like? A lot of times when you see a chassis, you'll see it's got all the knobs on it. It's got, you can adjust the length of pole, the cheek rise or whatever. You can even adjust the angle of the butt, what way it's angled into your shoulder pit or whatever. Um, is that like the one size fits all or one size fits most? But then if you get a custom most. stock, is that like way better because it's a custom stock and it's whatever, you know? Not necessarily. What's the whole stock versus chassis thing then? I mean... The only time I'd ever get a like a, a 
custom stock. I don't even know if anybody even does this really, um, but like a custom stock that wasn't adjustable would be as if I've been shooting for a long time and I just know that this is what I use. Got it. You know, um, and 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 even then, I don't know if I would. Yeah. Right, because then, because now you're just now you're to that point to like you've condemned yourself to not ever trying anything new mm-hmm. if sure. that's the only stocks you own. Sure, right. Um, at least in your training with the equipment you currently own, right. Of course, you could shoot somebody else's rifle or whatever, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd ever do that. Does, but does that come? Do you pay a price with weight though? As far as with uh, like all the you know with the chassis. adjust with the chassis and adjustability and Scott doesn't care about knobs weight. and widgets and that's very true. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, you're gonna add anytime you yeah. add stuff, you're adding weight, right? Um, I think a lot of the hell, actually, I think most of the chassis manufacturers are actually making stuff to make their stocks heavier. Sure, you know, lead inserts and whatnot, which which has been going on for years in different areas of shooting but um you know for 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 precision shooting weight is is not an enemy necessarily oh no no right which is not, not yeah an it's enemy. different than like a wisconsin or minnesota or iowa deer drive rifle you know oh yeah like carrying it around all day gonna make a couple hundred yard shot maybe versus something on a precision rifle where you're really just striving for the best accuracy and precision yeah I mean, that's where the guys are really adding weight. You're probably not going to add lead weights to the stock of your Ruger American if you're trekking it around the Midwest. But yep. if you're looking at supported, barricaded, prone shooting, yeah, I'm probably going to try and make that thing yeah. as heavy as possible. Yeah, I tell you what, man, those you're talking about the Midwestern hunter. Then you look at the Western hunter too. I feel like I feel like they're in an identity crisis out there now. They don't know what gun, like what what gun to go use out there. Some of them they towed around. Big heavy precision guns with Razor Gen twos on them. Some of them towed around super ultra light sub five pound guns. Some of them just towed around same kind of thing we towed around here. Yep, yep. I think it depends. You know, you're talking about the level of precision. Oftentimes, right? You know, what's what's your comfort zone? Are you shooting two, three hundred yards even out west, or are you trying to extend that effective yeah. range? I do know application like I, I, application, and then you got some guys that are shooting. Pretty darn long range with the, which I'd call like a traditional kind of sporting rifle design. But yeah. I do like, which is that's predominantly what I shoot, right? But I know, man, every time I get behind one of these, you know, heavier precision type guns, you get behind that thing, you're like, oh yeah. Cadillac. Like, feels good. <laughs> you know, you know it's you're nice. going to break a good shot. You start noticing things like when I get behind the old Ruger stock, even though I don't have it on my gun anymore, I start noticing just how much this grip. Right. Is angled backward, and I I keep wishing it was more up and down, yeah, more of a yeah. pistol grip. And I start noticing things like it is just really light. It's a traditional kind of, stock, yeah. right? Like a traditional hunting stock, we'll call it, is swept back. It's made for offhand shooting or supported right. shooting, leaning up against a tree or something like that. You know, there right. there there's a difference, and I think even. When you talk about length of pull, you kind of mention you get a stock and it's got a million different spacers in it. Even you get your Magpul stock, it probably came with a pack of spacers about like that thick. Yeah. Right? Like 10 of them. Well, initially setting, you know, setting your length of pull is pretty simple. You, I, I mean, the way that I've done it in the past is I just put the butt stock right here and I try and get it so that when my finger's at a 90 degree angle, it sits on the trigger. Wait, you set it like, that was like, what, like yeah, on pass your bicep that, basically? Yeah, pass me one of them their guns. So I would take it, and I would take a gun. This is unloaded, but I would kind of set it just like this. In your elbow right? pit. Yeah, and I would try and get it so that when my finger creates that 90-degree angle, that's the perfect amount of spacers. So you can add or subtract a lot of so times. So is this just right for you right now, or is this yeah, a little about short, good. little Yeah, it's about good. I long. mean, you see this? This is like a 90-degree yeah. angle, right? Yeah. So that's good, but, you know, then you get the benefit of, like, a chassis, Yeah. right, where – you're doing prone shooting and standing off of a barricade or shooting over a vehicle or something like that. When you're prone, typically your length of pull is going to be different than when you're offhand. So that's where kind of some of that adjustability comes in and is really nice to be able to make those adjustments. Is your length of pull usually a little bit longer when you're prone? So if you set it for shooting offhand and 
you go to prone, the gun will typically push out a little bit farther. Okay. Because you're kind of resting up here instead right, of right, right, right here. So, yeah, and your head's up, you know, at a different angle and whatnot. So, is there, if you don't plan on making an adjustment, let's say you have an adjustable stock and you don't plan on adjusting between, I guess, shooting positions, where should you set that stock? Somewhere in between all of those, that's, or best for that's one. That's what I do. I mean, I make sure I can use my gun in any position that I might come across. Right. Right. Um, now, some of that's going to be in your because I'm now I'm strictly speaking to a scoped rifle here. Right. right. Um, you know, some of that's going to be in the forgiveness of the eye box of the rifle scope you're using. Also, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, we're lucky. Our our Gen two four and a half twenty seven has phenomenal eye box right and that's not a shameless plug it's just a fact right it's just it's great in that aspect Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so it allows you that comfort of being able to basically kind of go middle of the road and be able to shoot all positions Mm -hmm. um now that being said i am 80 20 towards the prone shooting because that's typically the stuff that has to be most precise Okay. Sure. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So I want it set up there at least eighty twenty for that, and then I can do the rest. I might not have like a full field of view or something from a really odd position, or I might be you know far back, or I might need to turn magnification down in order to get a good sight picture. But it's still not a tough shot. It's just not an ideal head position for the rifle scope, not necessarily the gun. Sure. Gotcha. We didn't even talk about quite yet. We've alluded here and there, but about how all of this winds up interacting with your optic, right? Yep. So it's got it's going to interact with you, and that's important to figure out sort of where it, how it fits you, what fits you best. Um, but then this is all in the name of two, getting yourself in a good position for a fundamentally good shot, but also getting yourself in a good position to get behind the optic well. Yeah. Which a ton of people completely overlook. You yeah. see it all the time where they get it and they just sort of, there's some general rule of thumb out there that they read online one time as to, you know, well, when the bolt's closed, put the mag ring in line with the bolt and you're good. And Mark, that's can not. Can I use your paper to draw a diagram? Please. Excellent. Oh, there we go. There we go. So I've... This is kind of one of the things we do when we're talking a little bit about scopes, right, with people. Um, Your eye relief and your eye box are two different things. And you kind of want to have your eye be right in the middle of your eye box and then at that kind of that perfect point for eye relief as well. So like your X and Y, right, you want to get in that right spot. So your eye relief kind of comes out the back of the scope in like this somewhat of a diamond-shaped kind of triangle thing. And then it kind of tapers back like this. And so we can have a scope. This is my, I'm my scope. tilt it up just real quick for the cameras. Nope. Up, Here's Ruben's awesome drawing. That's, that's my apologies. upside down. Okay. Wait, what way did yep, you Yep, right there. There we go. Here's Ruben's here. drawing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. it kind of looks on. like a candle. But so this num- this here... That's kind of like where our eye box is the biggest, and that can either slide backwards or forwards depending on our eye relief number, right? So if we see four inches of eye relief, that's what we're looking at. That's okay, so what, yeah, what you're getting at is the eye box yep. is most forgiving at the set eye relief. At a certain number, right? And, and the so, further and closer you get from that set eye relief, the more constricted your eye box gets. Yep, and so you can have a couple things too. You can have a scope that has a shorter eye relief, right? Like that number here. Yeah. And that's where your eye relief is, but it could be larger or it could be smaller. Typically, like, we want a good balance. We want right. this space here to be pretty open so that if I move my head up and down or fore and aft, I'm not losing my sight picture. Did I screw anything up? No, that's good. So that's what like kind of like that last, you know, bracket or area that you're talking about. That's when people say it has a nice eye box, like yeah. a for, or a forgiving, forgiving eye box. Eye box yeah. I hope can, I get, I hope I get photoshopped like Donald J. Trump every time he signs a new bill. <laughs> but that line, that sweet spot, kind of like that vertical line area that you're talking about. Yeah, and we could even. We can um, even call that a, a, a like 
eighty percent box, right? Like sure. Yeah. Here, we want our eye to be somewhere in there. But you can t- when you get on. Let's say you had a, a scope that was mounted. I mean, you can kind of tell when that happens. Like you move, you creep in, and you kind of the sight picture gets fouled up, and then you back off a little bit, and yep. then that it gets, and then you kind of find, you know, just mm-hmm. like that sweet spot yeah. where you're like, yep. There it is. And the whole reason of showing this diagram is that you want the scope, you want to have everything about the rifle and scope set up in such a way that your eye is in that sweet spot. Correct. When Very you, naturally. When naturally. 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 It's not in the guy behind the scope counter's, you know, eye position. It's not in your buddy's eye position, the guy on the forum eye position, whatever. Your eye, when you're in your shooting position. That's that's where your eye should be, in that sweet spot. That's important, and it also goes for scope height too, because Absolutely. you see all kinds of people they'll throw on you know, the the biggest face palm uh, version. I'm just gonna throw it out that way because it is is like the see through rings. You know the, the peak like, under. Oh, I still want to be yeah, able to use my under. irons Sorry. underneath the underneath the scope. I don't get see through peak under is the technical term. Peak unders, <laughs> sure. So. Uh, you know, but then your scope is up really <laughs> high. You might as well have just not even put a scope on the gun at that point. Yeah. Like if you want to use your irons, just use your irons. It's cool. We'll we'll let it slide. But you they know, were also developed when scopes weren't one to tens. Yeah, they weren't exact. Yeah, it was, it was a it was a you know a, a two to six or something like that. But uh, which I suppose with the right stock, you could compensate. You could for that. But then I guess you wouldn't be able to probably use. Uh, right. They're right. made for speed. Yeah. Yeah. Not for comfort. Yeah. So, but the thing is, is that then people try and get, they get comfortable behind the rifle, yep. but the scope is too high and the image looks really milky or something like that. Here you're milky or it's shadowed on the bottom or something yeah. like that. Um, or on the top, I should probably say. Um, but yeah, so your scope pipe can play into it a lot. Hey, can you talk about real quick too, speaking of scope height, optic over bore height? Sure. Why does everybody get so freaked out about getting their bar- their scope like, like yeah, I don't paper, know. like paper distance away from the barrel? I think it has to do with the stocks. Well, most of the time, no, I, I guess it, it maybe that does maybe that's where it comes from is like the just hunting stocks because the, able to because get the on comb, the, yeah, right. So you want it, the problem is is that you I see what you're getting at, Jimmy, is how it has kind of translated and in, over into precision shooting right and people somehow think it makes them a better precision no shooter or I, I, well there's that maybe a little bit but i think also there's um there's kind of this myth that the closer you are to the barrel the more adjustment you're going to get out of your rifle scope okay yeah for as far as elevation adjustment goes right um which is it's just not true right it, it it affects it so minute that it's just it's unnoticeable right um maybe at like extreme close distance right it may well, make three a feet yeah and, and actually the the interesting thing is is <laughs> is if you use a taller mount um because of the height over the bore that you're you're having to um i think you got to use more so, adjustment right <laughs> yeah but at, at because of the the height, I remember doing the math on it one time. It, it ended up being like with a, a you know one and a half inch mount to one inch that actually ended up being able to use a little bit more of the scope's adjustment at you know at oh, some random sure. long range. Sure, sure. Well, now, you know, so <laughs> and interesting kind of, kind of getting into scope, but it's mounting. so minute. It's it's negligible. It, it doesn't matter, right? In the exactly, grand scheme. exactly. I think so not. The, the more important thing is to be comfortable, wasn't it? Yes. This might be completely wrong, but I thought I remembered hearing that Roy Weatherby invented a Monte Carlo cheek piece, which is that raised cheek piece right. on the rifle stock. Which um, I don't know who invented it, but yeah, I, don't, I definitely know who made it about. made it famous. Um, but yeah, the Monte Carlo cheek piece is when you see, uh, you know, I'm just thinking like it's kind of like this. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. like it's a raised <laughs> yeah. portion of your cheek piece to get your head up closer to the right. scope's uh, sweet spot. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, so that you when you shoulder that rifle, you don't have to go like, uh, you just kind of set your cheek on. Yeah, or you don't have to crane right. your neck up a little bit. Yeah, there's actually, you know, um, amongst, uh, I guess, you know, intermediate to uh, expert shooters these days, there's kind of been of a trend to go toward taller rings in a number of um, different uh, 
shooting disciplines. Um, obviously, three gun has been one of them. Um, those guys have started going oh, the up to one, one the one point nine three height. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so essentially two inch height. Which Reason is, being, uh, so the Daniel the, Horner. Daniel Horner definitely started it. I, I, Why do you do it? I know it was a thing about it. Why, why do you do it? Because he does. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but then also for, for the same reason, even precision guys have started doing it too. So on bolt guns, because the reason being is because the lower the rings, lower your scope is on your rifle, the more tilted your head is actually looking through that scope. Okay. So the sure. higher the scope is, you can now keep your eyeballs in your head more straight it to the seems scope, l- right? So you're not natural. straining your eyes. It's more natural, right? It's the same reason why they tell you when you're shooting your pistol to not bury down deep in your arms, but have the pistol come up and meet your eyes, right? Exactly. So you're not trying to look through your skull. Yeah, you're not, you know, you're not doing the old, right? The right. You want to bring the gun over. to your eyes. The old, uh, <laughs> it's, they call them turtling in our little pistol Correct. course the other day. Turtling, turtling. Yeah, I picked- Originally known as the Hollywood rifle, Roy Weatherby's stocks featured a unique raised comb Monte Carlo cheek piece. Thank you for looking that up. Nice. I like it. What so we're kind of talking about you know rifle scope mounting here, but I I've seen some where the optic is mounted solo such that the bell like you talked about sliding a piece of paper. Oh yeah, like you because are literally you hear people talk about that. Getting, they brag about it. Oh, right now. Let me ask this: when the gun goes off, a lot of vibration going on. Is when you have that little I guess whatever margin of error that yes, small it's space. The scope. So yeah, the scope is hitting essentially the, the barrel Barrel's of the gun. The scope. Absolutely, it is. I can't think that. The, I mean, we make a really, really durable scopes, but is that could that be having an impact on accuracy or the optic itself or uh, over time? Lots of things or, are durable. There's no reason to slap them with a barrel every time you use them. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, right? it's just why why do it? <laughs> I shot a whole season of PRS like that. You did. Yep. Okay. Why? Well, that's good to know. Why'd you do it, Scott? Well, I actually, mine wasn't paper thin, though. I had about a hundred thou gap. Oh, okay. So I was just using one. Yeah, you one. would think that'd be fine. Yeah, no. There was distinct marks on the barrel and the bottom of the scope <laughs> when I took it off. I think I showed it to a few of these guys. I should probably look at some of the some of my scopes because they're yeah. probably about that high. Yes. And that, I mean, well, that's, and that's still, a heavy barrel. They're still working, right? everybody. Right. <laughs> yeah, not like one of these little lightweight yeah. contours. I mean, I never had an impact. I mean, it never affected anything. Yeah. Um, but it's a Gen 2 Razor, right? It's built like a tank. So, hmm. but yeah, it was, I was, I was, it was really interesting to see that. Interesting. I'd be curious, though, because like probably what you kind of showed there, that's probably about, I'd say, on average, what most of my rifles are. Yeah. The, la- the last thing I'll throw out there, too, regarding scope mounting, I think I've probably even thrown it out on a number of these other episodes, too, but it's, it's just do it when your scope is on its highest magnification. Yeah. I mean, I right. can't, like, so yeah, many times. Yeah, you can't get eye relief properly if you, you don't do that. You can't. Cause, and, and I know why people do it, because I've even caught myself doing it. Sometimes you're trying to get a scope set up, and you're like, you know, this, the very first initial rough setting the scope in the rings, it's, it's never right, right off the bat. You can get it kind of close. And you look through and you're kind of like, ah, yeah, shoot, it'd be really easy if I could just see through this scope so then that way I can figure it out. So you back down the magnification and then you're like, oh, wait a minute. I just made it easier for me to see, but I also made it really hard to figure out the exact spot. Right. You know, the, kind the of highest- sucks too because you're taking it in and, out, in and out of that tipped and gun vice every time, oh, screwing up your level. Right, exactly. But in order to get the, the most critical magnification will always be, or the most the most critical point in the eye relief and eye box area will always be the highest magnification. And I see it all the time, though, where people will say, you know, scope's great. All of a sudden, I crank it up to the highest magnification, though, and it's, like, super dark. It gets really cloudy. There's a mm-hmm. ton of shadowing, whatever it is. And you know it's because... Either, when they mounted it themselves, they didn't have it on that highest magnification. They put it on the lowest mag, so yep. they could see it real easy. They didn't get it quite right, got it good enough for the lowest and most forgiving magnification. Or their gunsmith, guy behind the counter, buddy, mounted it up for them, got it right for them, but they have a much different body structure, facial type, whatever. Their stock isn't cor- isn't adjusted to the proper length of uh, like comb, length of pole. Um, comb height. Length, comb of, height. length of comb. Yep. Uh, you know, length. whatever it is, and then they you can they, take that to the bank, and then they <laughs> run into those, then they run into those issues. But yeah, the uh, 
you know, obviously there's there's more than one way to do this, but a, a, a good, fairly quick, easy way um, to set your eye relief on your scope, um, even with a, a hunting rifle. Um, if, if you have two people, it'll make it a little easier. Um, but if it's just yourself, find something, whether it's a towel, paper towels, what anything you can use for a spacer to put over that buttstock to establish the correct cheek height to where you don't have to worry about moving your head up and down while you're trying to move the scope back and forth hmm. okay. to figure out the, oh, yeah. the eye relief, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can get your head in a fixed position, and now you can manipulate the scope, or if you have another person, they can manipulate the scope fore and aft for you on the highest duck, magnification. Duck until you, I'm wondering where the second person came in. Right, there. until you get that widest point in the field of view, and then you can... You yeah. know, make a note of that and then start, you know, finish mounting. The other thing, too, is a lot of times people, uh, especially in the Midwest, um, you go into a sporting goods store and have a scope mounted in July in your t shirt, and then you go and sure. grab your, you know, three and a half inch thick blaze orange hoodie <laughs> and shoot it in the fall. Like, it's not going to be right. Yeah. So that's fair. Yeah. Keep in mind whatever you're going to be wearing, too. Here's a kind of random backtracking question too so it just it just occurred to me as well when we were talking about those higher mounts that guys are using now you know how is that not do you have to change your shooting form a little bit when you're using a higher mount versus a lower one because i'm trying to think of like if i'm prone for example and i'm having to go like that to look through it instead of being right on it. Just how are a, you getting? Just like, use a jaw weld. How are you getting of a, a cheek natural? Weld. How are you getting a natural, consistent cheek weld? There comes a point, higher? especially if you're talking about like. And then if you're adjusting the thing up, then you're going back to this. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Think think about this a couple in a couple of different ways. So there there's a fine point between speed and accuracy where you have to decide what's more important. Okay. And there's also going to be you're going to have to make a few compromises along the way. Yeah. So you're going to have to say. I'm at this quote unquote match and I'm going to shoot, you know, most of the targets here with my rifle are going to be offhand from 10 yards to 50 yards. Okay. I'm going to have four or five targets on, we'll call it two stages out of 10. So a total of like 10 targets where I have to shoot longer distances prone or off of a barricade or something like that. Same goes with uh, PRS type shooting. Um, those guys are going to be able to adjust their cheek pieces a lot between from stage to stage depending mm -hmm. on if they're shooting standing up off of a barricade or prone but for me i'm looking at it okay what what's the most valuable targets here is there a hundred rifle targets from you know five yards to 50 yards and then there's 10 long range targets what am i focusing on am i focusing on a 10 do i set my rifle up for those 10 targets or do i set them up for the these 100 targets because if I set it so it's perfect for when I'm prone and I'm shooting a 193 or a 204 height scope mount, if I set it up so it's perfect for the long range, well, now I just kind of screwed myself on all those offhand shots that are hmm. close, okay? Versus if I set it up right, and, and there are guys too that are going to have, you're going to have matches where you have close targets and long range targets in the same stage and you can't make adjustments. But... I'll make adjustments if there's only close targets on a stage or only long range. Yeah, I'll make that adjustment so it's set for those targets. But if I have to find the happy medium, I'm going to get a jaw weld instead of a cheek weld on those long range if there's only a couple long range. Or I'm going to have to have my cheek piece a little high more than I'm comfortable for all those close range targets. Yeah. So, yeah, you're going to have Because the high a, mount is a little bit easier to use when you're up when you're offhand rather than being yeah, prone. Yeah, right? and, and that's, that's kind of part of that um kind of like scott said when you're shooting a pistol you bring a pistol up to your eyes mm -hmm. you don't drive your head down when i'm shooting a rifle if i'm doing work offhand um i'm going to bring the rifle up into my field of view into my kind of that natural point of aim that into my vision and so it's here so i don't have to like duck my head down i want that when i bring the rifle up that cheek piece should come and hit as i bring it up and the scope should be right there. my head's not going Ugh. Right. Like, no, gotcha. let's just boom. And then as I look, as I naturally point towards all those targets, I'm just pressing the trigger as I get lined up on them versus having to think about, like, oh, where's my cheek? Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, there's there's never a, a do-all thing. <sighs> That's the thing that sucks. Sorry. Everything's a, everything's a trade-off. Life's full of them. 
Life's full of them, man. That's why you should get a razor one to ten. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it, folks. And there you have uh, it. No more trade offs. Oh, that's that. uh, We're done. Uh, yes. <laughs> I yes. think we can trim that down to 30 seconds. There's no Jim. such thing yeah. as a perfect. Wait. Oh, but wait, there is. Do we hit everything? What do you guys think? On, on, on shooting form slash also maybe figuring out a little bit. I don't know how much, you know, like about all these different kinds of rifles and getting them fitted to you. I mean, really, it seems like you just, you kind of have to shoot a lot to figure out once you start making big adjustments to your rifle and how listen, it's all set up. Listen to people that have experience. I think it's. People that offer experience usually aren't offering it so that you do things the way they tell you to. They're doing it because they want to save you all the money and time that you spent doing it. Right. So that's, I think, a big thing is when somebody says, hey, man, that's a good stock, but if you're doing a lot of prone shooting, I don't like it. Okay, you know, most of the time, unless you have completely different facial and body structures, he's probably on to something. Yeah. I do like the fact that nowadays you see a lot of the rifle companies, you know, like you got your Ruger RPR, you got your Tika T3, it's something X, what is it again? Something. Oh, it's a T3X. T3X. Um, but yeah. the, the, the more entry level, so to speak, chassis guns that have a lot of adjustment, it is, you know, if you're somebody who doesn't quite know what exactly what you like yet, get something like that, or even just yep. the, the separate chassis that you can get for relatively inexpensive, like, you know, KRG would be one example I can think of off the top of my head, that do allow some adjustments so you can figure out, you know, yeah. oh, you know, I like my length of pole this way, or I like my cheek riser up with a mount that's this high. And and I think in a lot of, like, what what kind of what my my group at, here at work focuses on is getting a lot of people behind guns and getting a lot of, a lot of rounds and experiences. Mm-hmm. Is you'll come and look in our trailer, and almost every single stock on the rifles has at least an adjustable cheek piece. Mm-hmm. At least, like I think there's maybe three or four out of twenty some rifles that ha- that don't have some form of adjustment. And when we can, we have adjustable length of pull and adjustable cheek piece because that's like part of that whole getting set your gear, gear set up right. Is we'll see somebody. You know, and you see it a lot where somebody's like, I really like shooting that rifle. We talked Mm -hmm. about it with shotguns. Like, Mm -hmm. I shoot great with that shotgun. Well, it's probably just set up for you. Yeah. You know, you hit that. You you roll the dice and it was right. And that's the thing, right? Like, if you're somebody who's, you know, scared to pull the trigger on a a precision gun um, because you're afraid that you're not going to get the right one, well, I can tell you, chances are you're not going to get the right one the first time, right? So just mm-hmm. just buy something, start messing with it. Chances are you can sell it for pretty close to what you got into it, or you can just keep it because it was your first precision gun, whatever you got to do. But if, if you're interested in it, just get into it and then start doing it. Uh, otherwise, you're, it's just not going to happen if you don't do that, you know? Well, I think for also, you know, a person who has a rifle set up and they start thinking about this a little bit and they're, man, I'm really fighting this rifle. Like, I have to fight this rifle to get behind it properly. It could be a simple adjustment. It could be a scope adjustment. It could be a different... Yeah, it could be a different type of adjustment, but with all the different stocks out here, there's probably something that's going to fit you or, you know, you you know, mount your scope a little higher or lower or, you know, adjust, you know, maybe somebody did mount that scope for you and the eye relief isn't right for you. It could be a simple eye relief thing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and the good thing about it is, is... You don't have to go spend a bunch of money to figure out if, you know, comb height or length of pull is the problem, right? Now, if length of pull is too long and it's not adjustable, that's going to be a little tougher to figure out. But generally, most guns don't have too long of a length of pull. You know, most most people run into issues. Unless you're a child or somebody like myself, you don't typically run into issues of uh, with with the guns being totally unusable with length of pull, right? For like those for who me, don't know, Scott, he's not a child. He's actually really big. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were saying a chi- you were a child, like I'm a child. Well, <laughs> mentally, but, you know, anyways, I was saying the, you know, a, a factory gun without any adjustments typically has too short of a length of pull for myself, right? Mm-hmm. And then also gotcha. for a child, a factory gun typically will have too long too of long. a length of a pull, right? So if it's not adjustable, uh, us two categories are the, you know, kind of, um, the unfortunate, unfortunate, the exactly. unfortunate few. Thank you for the PC word that I wasn't going to use. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. I already got bleeped out once, so I had to make up for it on this podcast. Um, but anyway, so my point is, is use anything like 
going right back to where we started at the beginning of this podcast is use anything you absolutely need to to figure out how to get comfortable behind that rifle, right? It doesn't matter if it's a little shooting pack, a towel, washcloth, socks, whatever. You can adjust that length of pull and that comb with artificial stuff to figure out exactly what you need. Oh, yeah, you don't have to go out and get some. Right. And then now, I'm not saying gas. use that permanently, but at least then you can figure out what you need. Oh, that's fair. Right? That's a good point. So that is, good or point. one of you know, I mean, I forget the name of those, but Bradley Cheekress. I was going to mention you know? it because I'm pretty sure Brad knows where I live, and uh, he <laughs> might come and find me if I don't uh, plug it. So Brad, <laughs> doing it. Bradley Cheekress. They're actually really nice. They're super super nice. Yeah, you can turn your regular Ruger American or whatever it is, you know, with just a okay stock. You can turn into a. Those really are nice universal. I mean, that'll go on any universe. stock. Oh yeah, it will. It will. Yeah. And uh, much less He's expensive. Got cool designs too. Much less expensive than a brand new stock or chassis. It's got cool designs. It'll match any camo color, whatever. Well, so, and to your point, Scott. I mean, that's a good. That's a a step up from socks. Absolutely right. And yeah. you got a lot of adjustability. Yeah, and I shot multiple Vortex extremes with the old Bradley cheek rest. They're awesome. You can use it in real life stuff. Mark, any other last calls from you? Because I know you usually have about seven to eight. I'm tapped out. I'm tapped out. Here's here's my last call. So I am becoming more drawn towards, uh, I guess, this, you know, this style of stock here, you know, kind of these more precision stocks. And, you know, no secret, hunting is, you know, just like Scott's into, you know, precision rifle. Ruben does a variety of things, but big into three gun and probably Western big game hunting is, or hunting in general, or is, is kind of my forte. But and I brought up the weight earlier because I'm weight conscious. And there's a lot of really great lightweight rifle stocks nowadays that have a lot of these precision rifle stock attributes. Right. Yes. And I like that. There. <laughs> you don't need to be weight conscious. You could be drinking 2% if you wanted. I'm not as weight <laughs> conscious about my own weight, so I need to make up for that in the <laughs> rifle. Okay. Got it. You can drink 2%. <laughs> well... That'll do it. I think we're good. So let us know if you have any other uh, thoughts or questions or anything like that on this particular topic uh, or if we should expand on anything, too. Yes. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Thanks, Ruben Scott. Happy Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, Felicia. Why are you looking at me so funny? What? I wasn't. Yes, you were. Very when? much so. When? Throughout the whole podcast. <laughs> I was, I was trying I was, to smile more. I was, okay? get, I was getting self-conscious because I probably said maybe a lot of wrong things. I don't know. I was. I'm trying to smile Mark, more. Okay? Where did this come from? You sh- should have seen the way he was looking at me. I I was looking at Ruben a lot. I didn't. I, I just tried to have a permanent smile on my face because people tell me I look grumpy. Okay. All right. <laughs> what is that? It's my permanent smile. That's, that's not that's, a smile. That's the look Ruben was giving me. That was a little group is good. That I, is that. That's some bull. Was that his smile right there? <laughs> that's a smile. <laughs> that's a smile. That's a smile. That's a genuine smile. Try and recreate what you were doing. You were making me self conscious. I can't even try. I can't even do it. All I was picturing is Mark, like in a toga, with like. Why is Mark in a toga? Because he's at the Sydney house. Oh, you were thinking about that the whole time. Part of it. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.